Uh, all right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Kelly Fox. We're at Adia Wine Company. It's August 1st, 2019. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. We thank you for this. having me. Uh, we'll start by asking, uh, why wine? <laughs> That's, that is a little bit of a trite question. <laughs> um, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the long answer is that uh, I grew up in a family that drank wine every day with the, the meals. Mm -hmm. It wasn't one of those uh, stories where, where Uncle Henry showed me my first first growth Bordeaux and ever since then I loved, never looked back. It wasn't one of those, mm -hmm. but it was part of my daily life and um, I did spend about five years in the Netherlands, maybe six, mm -hmm. from the ages of four to 11 and was introduced uh, to cultures that, you know, at the time are very different than the culture we see here mm -hmm. in America around food and wine. So it's just normal. Uh, actually, I moved to Oregon uh, in the late 80s. I can't remember when. It could have been 89. To uh, get a degree in biochemistry and biophysics because I wanted to understand life on from that point of view. I had already uh, obtained a, a BS in the liberal arts and had a minor in biology, but I, I wanted to uh, perhaps uh, learn about, <laughs> I wanted to use my biochemistry degree to learn about a holistic healing, mm -hmm. especially working with shaman and healers in equatorial regions of South America, perhaps Himalayas, and, and kind of be a liaison between uh, Western uh, medicine and traditional healing. So I'm telling you this now because it will help me answer a question you'll certainly ask later about biodynamic farming. <laughs> uh, so I was here and uh, I broke my arm playing a college sport that I didn't like, didn't like, but I just wanted to be in shape. So. <laughs> and uh, I had a cast on, I was at the Beanery, which is a coffee house in Corvallis, and I met someone else who had a cast who had heard himself working in production at Taiyi. And that person ended up being the father of my children later, and he was planting a vineyard uh, near Broadley Vineyard. And uh, from that point, uh, you know, wine was again part of my daily life. Yeah, you know, he'd done a lot of work with the Broadleys for trade, so we were drinking Broadley 92s, and I was just a poor, poor college student, <laughs> just going, "What the fuck? You know, <laughs> this is so good." And, uh, going back uh, even uh, before that, I. Uh, there's nowhere to live when I moved to Oregon, and uh, the first place I could find was this double-wide trailer in um, the Coast Range. On the sh it was on this gravel road called Shangri-La Lane, and it <laughs> backed up to BLM Forest, and it was on the North Fork of the Alsea River, outside of the town of Alsea. Now, mm -hmm. this is coming from Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I was so poor by the time I moved into this thing that um, I had already worked as a maid at the Jason Inn Hotel where I ran out of money, the motel, whatever. Uh, so, uh, but I was drinking wine, and the wines that I was drinking were, you know, all the. It's hard for me to say the correct variety name, but Marechal Foch. Mm -hmm because I have another name for it that's not polite um, <laughs> at all. And it's really hard for me to not say that. Um, but I drank that and Pinot and things like that in the 6 to $11 bottle category and just thought, this is the coolest place ever. Like here I'm drinking, you know, family-made wine mm -hmm. in this beautiful place where I see flying squirrels overhead when I'm driving home from squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to this Swiss chalet, you know, double wide, and I thought, you know, this is great, but it just became this latent seed in me. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, after planting, helping plant that vineyard, then uh, uh, Sterling and I ended up moving to uh, Bill Fuller's house, and it, I hope you've interviewed him. Mm -hmm. So, we, after he left that house, and that's a to me a sad story, but after he left the house, Sterling and I moved in because he became the vineyard manager for Lambeth Valley Vineyards. Mm -hmm. So we lived on Bill's property and raised our daughters there for a while from 97 through 2000. So then I started working in the vines um, separately from the guys because they, they're a family and they'd been working together for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there's one of those 
man there, I'd love for you to interview. His name's Efren Loiza. Mm -hmm. And he and Isabel are living in that house now. Amazing, beautiful people. Mm -hmm. So then I started managing the tasting room there. And then I worked a harvest at Willamette Valley Vineyards in 97. I did 40 hours on a weekend working in the lab. Um, because of my biochemistry background, I guess I thought I should be a lab bitch. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, by 2000, uh, we had moved to Jacob Hart Vineyard, mm -hmm. which was uh, started, I think it was used to be called King's Great, I can't remember something what, it, like that. King's something, but it was, under, it was owned by Paul Hart and Jan mm -hmm. Jacobson. Mm -hmm. That was in 2000. And so here we were living on another vineyard, and in that year, 2000, I knew that I, when it was like a calling, like being a priest. And I was, I was trying to get jobs anywhere I could. I tried to get a job with Lynn, and, uh, but uh, the first thing I could find was at Tory Moir. Mm -hmm. There was a huge chaos over there because Jim and Patty had just left, mm -hmm. and Bob McRitchie had taken over as a consultant, and there was uh, quite a bit of flow there, I'll say. <laughs> Uh, so, for some reason, they hired me, and uh, then I became, uh, I was originally hired for marketing, but very quickly became a seller worker, and when it, within the year, I was titled general manager and winemaker, which was absolutely ridiculous. I'm the general manager I can understand, but, so I actually hired people who, you know, had lots of years of training, including in the vineyard, uh, to help me, because, you, you know, you have to know what you don't know. Uh, I studied all of Patty's notes like they were a religion. Mm -hmm. um, I tried as much as I could to have some semblance of continuity between what she and Jim had done uh, and what was coming out. Um, of course, I know now what hubris that is. <laughs> but in 2002, when I resigned, um, Abruptly, uh, I went straight over to Patricia Green Cellars and hung out with Jim and Patty, and we became friends ever since that point. <laughs> but it, they were one of the people besides Irie at the time, and a few others like Bethel, who were making wines of place. So, and I'm saying that for later, because <laughs> you will be asking me about my approach. So, does that answer the question a little bit? <laughs> Absolutely. Take me through the timeline from there and up to the point where you decided to kind of start your own, do your own thing. <laughs> well, that wasn't a choice. <laughs> Last thing I did was to work more hours and make more wine and have more responsibility. Uh, my path, as many people's paths back then, were not easy. Mm -hmm. it, you can't imagine what it was like back then. I mean, when you're a winemaker back then, uh, especially if your family didn't start it, mm -hmm. um, there's there is no glory in it. Um, you know, there is no outsourcing of lab work or outsourcing of people who could drive a forklift mm -hmm. or outsourcing people who would repair your shit half the time. Mm -hmm. And you're on your own, like a cowboy back then. And you certainly, unless you had some wealth, were not making wines in facilities designed for winemaking. Mm -hmm. Going back to Tory Moore, um, and Jim and Patty will, would have told Patty, the late Patty would have told you, in the tank room, there was one little drain that was about this big with little holes that you couldn't even put a hair through that was uphill. Mm -hmm. And you know, you're doing over 100 tons in a place like that. So you, there was definitely some drinking involved and some just laughing and <laughs> having some good times because uh, you had to be crazy to do it back then. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, after Tory Moore, uh, I didn't know what to do because it was so sudden. I just, <laughs> I think it was like, like two weeks notice. So I didn't know what to do. It was in the summer. It was right after AASCV was here. I remember this. And I think I told Jimmy Brooks about it. And he was going to Cirque du Soleil after AACV. And then all of a sudden I was in uh, the Dundee Bistro parking lot, which but then was kind of where everyone went. Mm -hmm. And Eric Homaker came up to me in the parking lot and he goes, Kelly, I heard you quit touring more. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like the day after, or like, I don't even know, I don't know what happened, but he goes, I'm doing this thing called the Carl Winemaker Studio. You know, really, it's a really great thing. You know, uh, it's gonna be environmentally uh, progressive and, you know, it's gonna be Andrew Rich, Lynn Penner Ash, Tony Soder. I mean, mm -hmm. this is gonna be 
incredible and would you be willing to help me with this? So what really happened was I did that for 8.50 an hour coming off of GM salary and uh, helped Eric move his stuff out of Adelsheim to the studio. Mm -hmm. I basically worked for the contractor, the general, because it wasn't even close to being built when I started. So I was like shoveling gravel and I think there was one time where I actually used a steamroller or something, <laughs> I don't know, or jackhammer, I don't know what it was. But I did all kinds of things that you know, I, if someone said in high school that I would be even touching something like this, uh, I would have just laughed my ass off because that, I just didn't see, I mean, I've been through a lot up to that point, things I, we don't have time to talk about, but um, I have some stories of, uh, when I was at Tory Moore that are just not even probably legal. Uh, I'm sure they're not. Um, but uh, so anyways, it got built just in time for 2002 Harvest. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Eric Homaker there in that harvest in 2003. I tried to quit that job a couple of times in 2003, but he, he would not accept that. <laughs> and so I st <laughs> I love Eric. Um, uh, I did things there that, I mean, I will, there's some things I will never do because of that time. Like mm -hmm. I will never build a wine house again. Um, I also will never work in a cooperative situation again, ever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then uh, backing up I can't tell you the next part until I tell you one of the stories of Tory Moore okay. so <laughs> the first harvest was in my opinion like a joke with what we had so the second harvest I said to Don the owner I said we cannot do this here like this this is not going to fly like we're moving all this harvest equipment over from some building with your vineyard manager or whatever, moving them to the winery. There's no room for all this. I can't do this in, in there. You know, I said, I have a solution. I'm going to write the, the city of McMinnville and ask them for a permit. And I'm going to ask them if we can erect a circus tent type of situation <laughs> at the trail that the, the dead end. It's a gravel road across mm -hmm. from a rubber mat factory, you know, towards the railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. So I can turn that into our processing facility outside because this is not going in there. And they gave me permission and they, they actually, I had a huge temporary metal structure, which is in fact like a circus, <laughs> which is perfect for what happened because it was a circus. And so we had the press out there and I'm talking, in public, on a public dead end in a town. So we were making wine out there and uh, uh, towards the end of it, I'm not kidding, we had a surprise uh, 20 tons come from Southern Oregon through the consultant that was working at the time. And we had no room. So we had to process all the 20 tons of Pinot Noir at the end of harvest, pretty much, in, back into their picking bins and I had them lined up in the gravel parking lot, and we were doing punch downs with a blue tarp over them. Oh, and so like wine was being made in public, like in a public dead end by the railroad tracks with the rubber mat factory right there. And so David couldn't help it. He was, cause Irie was right next to us mm -hmm. and we'd already become friends, but he couldn't help it. He had to go over and just take a look. Mm -hmm. And he, every day that I saw him those first few years, he was wearing a safari outfit with a handkerchief here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I loved him. I mean, our, we became fast friends, but at that harvest, he said something about my forklift driver, one of them, and about her reckless driving, and he was just giving me shit, and because she was a really good forklift driver. So, you know, I waited till I had some time, but yeah, you know, I grew up in a very mischievous family, and uh, to say the least, and uh, so I waited till the end of the harvest, and. I went over to Irie, and first I asked David, I said, you know, I was thinking about all those nights when I was under my circus tent at <laughs> three in the morning, and how you are gone at six with, you know, almost as much fruit every night. And I said, do you have Oompa Loompas? <laughs> and he, he wouldn't either deny or confirm that he did. But I said, would you, do you have a minute? Because I, I, I really was thinking about what you said about my forklift driver and I'd like for you to just come over and we really want to show you we took it to heart and that safety's first. And so he came over there and I sat him down in a chair in that parking lot and uh, gave him an MGD because that's what I, we, I did whenever I saw him. I gave him a nice long neck mm -hmm. and sat him down and we played Henry Mancini's Elephant Walk through the, and put the speakers outside. and. 
we had two forklifts. One was a bin dumper and one was the regular one. And we had them dressed out in red, white, and blue streamers. <laughs> and I got in the picking bin and uh, did synchronized ballet moves. And we did a synchronized forklift show for them <laughs> to show that we really were not only mastering safety, but even the fine moves of forklift driving were also mastered. And he, he almost beat his pants. He was laughing so hard. So, uh, speaking of bend I'll tell you one more story. <laughs> there, during that harvest, it was a shit show, as, as we all expected. And um, not only did Sterling drop off in his pickup a bunk bed and a, a hideaway couch and just left them there and drove off, which we used and slept in, but I needed some help one night. And David Autry from Wesselman came over and uh, Westry, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he and a friend helped us punch down one night, and uh, they invited us to a barbecue at their place, and so I decided we should all get into, sorry about this, should we stop? No, we do okay? Um, it's a pretty localized microphone, so it's fine. Okay. So um, everyone got into the bin dumper, so it was a picking bin, and I drove them in the bin dumper over to Westry, and uh, well, we had they had a barbecue, and we had some wine, and we thought, you know, Michael Stevenson must be pretty lonely over there at Panther Creek. We needed to go over and say hi. So Amy and David got into that picking bin with the, all the other people. I don't, it was like they're crammed with people, mm -hmm. and I drove the bin dumper with all them in the bin over to Panther Creek, <laughs> and. The door was locked, and uh, so, and we were knocking and knocking. So um, I lifted everyone up to this really high window, <laughs> and by now I was practically being in my pants. But they were like pounding out the window, and I think Karen Wright was there. I didn't remember this part, but someone told me that. I think it was Amy. She was, yeah, Karen was in there too. <laughs> but um, so Michael looked up and saw what the racket was and just opened the door and he, he was just totally dead man, you know, because Michael was a little wild himself, mm -hmm. but that's a little memory of the bin dumber. <laughs> uh, you know, now if you did something like that, you'd be arrested instantly, like that, that wouldn't even, you know, but people had that spirit back then, you know? So let's see, uh, David, called me on the phone at some point in uh, 2003, maybe early 2004, I can't remember, late 2003, early 2004, and he said there were some transitions and uh, I think Maitland was on the way out, he was leaving, and he asked me if I'd work for him. Mm -hmm. And we had a long talk in his office and I, you know, I said, sure, I'll work for you. I'll work for you. But I said, I already agreed to work for Grant Taylor at Gibson Valley in uh, New Zealand and that would be between late March or early April for about six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. I, I said I have to do that and but I'll work for you after that. So I went down there and worked for Grant and Grant and Michael Stevenson were friends and there was a certain cuss word I wouldn't say that was very popular there and so I remember one day Grant this is back when uh, mobile phones weren't really a thing. Mm -hmm. So Grant called from the landline, Michael Simpson at Panther Creek, and said, Kelly Fox wants to tell you something. <laughs> and he made me say the word. <laughs> but that, that phone was used a lot in the lab because David started calling me and saying, are you coming, are you coming? It's like, oh my God, I gotta go. <laughs> uh, and that's why Arabella Hall and Blair Trayton came down but I'm sure you're gonna interview Blair Trey then at some point. He was the winemaker at Shea for years. But, so then I started working for David. And so I bottled, I had to learn how to use, use this 12 spout bottling line mm -hmm. and double labeler, which was a little bit less difficult than rocket science. <laughs> I'm just, I'm being honest. <laughs> so, but I did. And then I bottled, um, I think about 8,500 cases of th uh, the 2013s that Maitland mm -hmm. helped and made, and the, the 20, 2003, and then I made the 2004s. And bottled all but I think the south block mm -hmm. of those. So uh, I did a lot of bottling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm gonna get out of the sun a little bit. 
So uh, that was great. I, that, I think that David was, who, was the person who taught me how to make mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. On the first day, um, he not only picked daffodils from his garden and put them in an Erlenmeyer flask, which is, he was legendary for tasting very formally out of Erlenmeyer flasks mm -hmm. and not wine glasses. Um, but he put three black glasses in front of me with two of his white wines and one of his Pinots, and I couldn't tell the difference. So that taught me so much about what Pinot Noir is. Mm -hmm. And um, little things like that. He never just was, you know, on a pulpit lecturing me. It was much more indirect than that. And that's how it got to me. Because if he had tried to be direct with me, it would never have worked. There were some times when he would say, Kelly, to the moon. Like, <laughs> I made him buy a new forklift. Uh, it was used, but he had this high stir, I think, and it was three wheeled. It had a great turn radius, but it was gas powered, and I had to jump start it almost every time. And we we're also an FOB loading point there, so that means that when org trucks come in to pick up orders to go into consolidation and distribution, I also did that job and all the inventory uh, and the winemaking. Uh, so it was a lot. So, uh, and then after that, I I was hired uh, as the head winemaker of Scott Paul Wines from 2005 through harvest of 2014. Why did I start making my own wine? Well, because my dad pretty much made me. <laughs> <laughs> he saw what was coming. He saw what I had done. Uh, he's a, a CPA and a businessman and has coached a lot of businesses, large and small, for decades and decades across the world. and. He knew because he, he knew that if I didn't do that, I would be Rumpelstiltskin for the rest of my life. And if you know that fairy tale, it's, he was, Rumpelstiltskin was in the back turning straw into gold for someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and it, but I never had this idea like, you know, when I worked for David, I worked for David. I used to tell him that all the time, you know, David, I work for you. You know, I never had any ideas to, you know, express myself or I just want my name on something or I just want it to be all about me. I never, I still don't feel that way. But uh, my dad had a little windfall from being a CFO on some kind of IT thing and he had a little money for capitalizing a very small winery. So I started out with 110 cases. <laughs> so it was literally pretty, like pretty small. a couple barrels each of Marsh and Montaze vineyards because I'd known both families since 2000 and there's stories there. But And very slowly, I mean, it was about that amount every year for many years while I was winemaker at Scott Paul. Scott Wright supported it completely. He was 100% behind me. But, you know, I was broke. Like, I had no money uh, ever and I still don't. But so it was, I slowly grew um, on cash sales and by 2014, I'd increased my production to about 750 cases, all off cash sales, no credit line. Yeah, because my dad capitalized it a bit in the first year or two and then cut me off, mm -hmm. which is, of course, he should have. Mm -hmm. um, and then once my relationship with Scott Paul, you know, with the ownership change, mm -hmm. uh, changed and I was no longer their winemaker, then uh, I was in a position of trying to find uh, a lender mm -hmm. to grow so so I could make enough wine to keep the company going and to pay my rent mm -hmm. so so since 2015 that that's all I've done I don't do any consulting or I don't have projects this is not a brand it's a winery um, I have no interest in doing anything else other than this mm -hmm. for any amount of money <laughs> Found your calling. Yeah, because yeah. So I'm curious. So. You, you mentioned in two, in 2000 or so was kind of when you, you got the bug. You got the kind of calling. Was the was it to just be in the industry in general, or was it why it was winemaking specifically? Wine making specifically. What, what about winemaking was it that appealed to you? I don't know. I mean, I know how it appeals to me now, but I've there was it was a it was like a lightning bolt that went through me. Mm -hmm. I, I work on instinct when it comes to my important decisions. <laughs> if I start, uh, I don't build up to important decisions by uh, through rationalization or deduction or just like, this would be the logical step. <laughs> like, I don't 
that's not how I make important life decisions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how I manifest what I want my dreams. I, then, then I go down, use my mind for that. Mm -hmm. Like if I already, if I know I want to do something, then I'll use a plan in my mind. Mm -hmm. But it, uh, the, the dream or the wish itself never comes from my mind. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what about it appeals to you now? What is it about being a winemaker? Uh, well, if I want to look at, look at it intellectually, I'll say that it's not boring. Um, I'm can, always in a state of wonder. Uh, and I'm amazed all the time. Uh, principally because I'm working with living systems, nature, uh, we really don't understand how plants work or how they relate to the stars or to the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, my job really is to hear, and I'm using metaphors because it's easier, so just imagine it's poetry, but it's not literal, but my job is to hear what the vineyards have to say, and it's not words, it's a song. Mm -hmm. And just like if you can imagine, like in classical music, that Chopin wrote a little nocturne. So it's the pianist's job to interpret that. It's already been written, mm -hmm. but to interpret it in a way that Chopin might have intended. But there's so much space around compositions for interpretation. Mm -hmm. I know that, but so I, you know, having been exposed and still drinking a lot of Burgundy. Pinot Noir to me is, of all the varieties, the most, and you, people argue Riesling for sure, and maybe Chardonnay and White Burgundy. I'm sure there's exceptions, but Pinot Noir to me is so truth telling. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, people find it so difficult, but it's not that it's difficult at all. It just reflects everything right back mm -hmm. in full honesty. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. No one really wants to look in the mirror. I certainly haven't wanted to, but. Pinot Noir has actually changed me. Mm -hmm. I've had to learn to uh, drop my ego and try to impose my ego and wishes on a vineyard and actually learn to shut that up and respond to it mm -hmm. instead. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes, to me, the most interesting Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in short, wines of place. Mm -hmm. So rather than approach it from this point of view, which is fair enough, it's just not mine. Wow, look at these grapes. This is my white canvas to express myself on, to make wines I really enjoy, mm -hmm. and to make wines that are critically acclaimed. And I, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It's really actually quite easy to do with the tools we have today. Um, you know, Scott Laboratories is very illuminating. You can build a wine in the winery and you can make a beautiful, delicious wine in the winery. Mm -hmm. But I think it kind of, that process breaks the spirit of the vineyard and the Pinot a little bit. And having been exposed to wines, great wines, fine wines that have all of their character and spirit, mm -hmm. uh, I want to have my wines taste truly of their Oregon origins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, without me imposing my crap on them <laughs> so and who I mean I love that and also uh, something I didn't anticipate was uh, it's forced me to do a lot of traveling mm -hmm. um, especially in the past few years mm -hmm. and uh, I some weird part of it is I there's a lot of really amazing cool people that give me hope in humanity that maybe I didn't have as much of before <laughs> all over the world uh, it's brought a lot of incredible people to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am very humbled by that. Uh, I had someone come a week ago, for example, who he, he coaches conductors for symphonies and orchestras. He's been doing it forever. He came from New York. And <laughs> I mean, I don't even know how he found me. <laughs> but, you know, these conversations that we have are very... Uh, I love having interesting conversations with people who... Not really directly about wine, but the arts, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or beauty, or other things. So mm -hmm. there's that component. That also, I think it's really uh, nice uh, 
to not live in abstraction, uh, like sitting in a cubicle and being between two people and pushing one document through me like an intestine, <laughs> shitting out to the other end from 95. That's not really my jam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that, yeah. So, uh, I'm, my brother says I'm not employable, so. <laughs> and it's very, very true. So eventually you got to do your own thing at that point if you're not employed. I didn't even see it. <laughs> so that kind of feeds into the next question I want to ask, which is about the biodynamic farming. So what, what is it about biodynamics that fits into what you're trying to do with, with your wines? Why is it important to you? It is, but I want to be very clear, you know, I'm probably not officially as biodynamic as most of my f peers here. I mean, let's face it. Uh, I'm not using a horse to plow, which I would love to do. Um, I don't own livestock, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, while I do my own little stuff, you know, I'm a little bit off the grid these days mm -hmm. in that department. Mm -hmm. But the first time I was exposed to Steiner was reading Education Towards Freedom. Mm -hmm. And it's a book about, well, the book about on which the Waldorf school systems were founded. And um, I had two children, so I read it a long time ago. And that was the first I ever heard of Steiner. Mm -hmm. And it had a strong influence on how I raised my daughters. Uh, the first time I had it just uh, when I knew was at the studio. And it was my friend Patrick Reuter, and he was from what I remember, I think they were Syrahs, but I thought he just asked a few of us to taste a bunch of blending options, like which blend is the best. Mm -hmm. But one of them, and I believe it was in 2002, I wrote in my notes, this one is utterly alive. And back then, people didn't use those descriptors for wine. They just, it wasn't a thing. And I was shocked when he told me afterward, he goes, well, actually, it's not what you thought. This, this, the one you said was utterly alive is a biodynamic one. It's mm -hmm. like, can you tell the difference between the, and, and that's when I knew, like it went into my body, like, and um, I'd already been studying uh, other things my whole life, like, it's, <laughs> it's going to sound so crazy, but um, the stars, the major religions, Eastern religions, mm -hmm. geology, rocks, um, how do I say, uh, in, in school, in college, um, shamans, healers, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So it all just kind of fell into place for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not uncomfortable in that world. Even from quantum physics, I know that intention can affect outcomes. Uh, this is very well known and documented. Uh, there's a lot of things we in, unseen and unobserved in this world, and that's actually th those worlds are the worlds I like to be in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Oregon has, has an ethos already that has been very much towards organic farming in general. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I'm, when I moved here, I uh, originally was going to start an organic farm with my brother and his best friend, um, but they bogged on me, and so I ended up doing biochemistry. Uh, how do I say this? Um, I, I like biodynamic farming because it's, it's not approaching the earth and the farm as just something you get something out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you read Ovid? Mm -hmm. Have you read Metamorphoses? Yeah, it's been a while, but yes. Do you remember when he was talking at the beginning talk, uh, about the Golden Age and the Silver Age mm -hmm. and the Bronze Age and then our Iron Age mm -hmm. and with regard to how we get our food? At the beginning, the Golden Age was we just lived off the land and mm -hmm. hunted. And in the Silver Age, we, I believe that was when we started doing some farming. Mm -hmm. But we always restored everything because mm -hmm. already that's damaging. And so it's from that point of view that I appreciate biodynamic farming. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just uh, consuming. It's it's sustaining, mm -hmm. uh, it's and it's loving a place. It's returning it uh, the energy back. Mm -hmm. uh, it's working with intention. Uh, it's thinking about others besides just yourself. Um, everyone's going to have a different answer for that, but after all these years, this is mine. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't always improve 
vineyards in the way you think. Uh, in a couple, in one case, but my biodynamic practices, the the thing they improved was me. <laughs> the farm had no problems at all. Still doesn't. It's Marsh. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2008, I went up to Jim Marsh, and we I love him. So I love that family so much. Mm -hmm. My God, I've known them since Lowy's Wake in 2000. Mm -hmm. I, I would not be here without Martha Marsh. But so I said, Jim, I have this idea. I, I said. I want to do this thing called biodynamic farming, but it's going to take a compost. It's going to involve a huge amount of organic cow shit being on your property that I, yeah, that I put straw on and I put weird stuff in there and I turn it around and then I put it back in the soil. And I just really think it's going to be great for your vines and because it's true that in some blocks there um, under someone else's uh, ward, a couple of blocks that we had with Scott Paul, those some blocks would not set. They're really pissed off. Mm -hmm. That's why the ones that I got for Kelly Fox, I immediately trained them, the canes, the way Jim had always done it, which is called art cane instead of flat. I mean, these are already middle-aged vines back then, and I just, they were pissed off, and sometimes they wouldn't set, like half tons an acre. And I knew that they weren't unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So that's another story, but, so he let me do it. He didn't say anything. So I did it, did it, it took months. Finally, it was time to put that in the back of a gator and start digging holes between his vines. And I did that, and every time I was digging holes, all this life would come out, like worms and insects. And after a while, I realized, <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm taking a vineyard out of chemical and pesticide dep dependency and restoring it. Like you read in all those books about the biodynamic farming and how it transformed the farms and mm -hmm. all the things they did to restore the farm. And when actually it was already right there, and it was my sense of vanity and a little bit of ignorance and uh, arrogance that I would come in to that farm that was planted, the vines were planted in 70, but they were there since the 50s. Mm -hmm. Me, who didn't ever have a farm, was going and telling, you know, a man in his 80s how I was going to help things out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I see that kind of stuff around here a lot, but I was just doing what everyone else did. <laughs> but. Uh, we laughed our asses off, and I stopped with the bite it out combos. But I still go in there and do the sprays personally. But it's it's not because I think I'm improving the vines. It's just for me to hear them better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So take me through from that side of things how that kind of all that kind of ties into your winemaking philosophy and how you would describe your winemaking philosophy. You talked about hearing the vineyard. Talk about biodynamics. So what is it you want your wines? What do you want people to get out of your wines? I want them to hear and feel the, the song from that particular place. A thousand trillion percent Oregon. I'm not trying to make burgundies. Those are in my wine locker. I don't need, I'm not trying to make a burgundy. Uh, Oregon has beautiful terroir. I know it's debatable to some but I have no doubt about it. We have not only, and it's so unique, it's not at all like Burgundy. We have volcanic soils and we have sedimentary soils. Mm -hmm. We have volcanoes, volcano energy, and we have ocean energy, very close. Mm -hmm. uh, we have tremendous uh, she here. Uh, and quite frankly, the health of our vineyards is a gift and it's something we should never take for granted. I mean, we have the benefit of youth here. <laughs> Imagine our vineyards a thousand years from now at the rate we're going and how we think. Mm -hmm. and talk about pesticides, we'll be right there. Um, we, you know, we need to be very, very careful about having too much monoculture here and, and being greedy and planting just vines and not allowing even prime, yes, prime vineyard land being uh, planted to trees and uh, places for beneficial insects and things like that. If, if we don't think ahead like that, we will be marching straight into pesticide use. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only way to manage insects is other insects, period. Um, and by the way, I wanna back up and talk a little bit about the term biodynamic in mm -hmm. Rudolf Steiner. Please. Uh, he did invent the word biodynamic in his particular methods of using sulfur and yarrow and all that. Those are his. Mm -hmm. 
but that general look at where the moon is and the stars and uh, holistic farming, that's probably about 5,000 years old. So it was really more of a revolution than it was uh, uh, an innovation. I want to stress that. Uh, we've lost our sense of timing with nature as it was a cost of being industrialized. I'm happy to have the internet. Uh, I don't want to go back. I'm not saying that, but we did pay an enormous cost. And uh, in, in the past, before we became industrialized, we knew when when the salmon were running. We knew when when to plant things. We knew all, we were, we had our timing of farming and fishing and hunting mm -hmm. with everything. So it's it's not really that weird or uh, woo woo or uh, new age or people are really annoying when they act like that when they're that way. But and I'm not saying it's science. And I absolutely don't care that it is or not. Science is very limited in what it can do and what it can't do. Um, so I'm gonna, that's, that's all I wanted to say about those things. Sure. So what was the next question? Well, we're talking about winemaking philosophy, but, oh. but, now, but now I'm kind of curious to talk about, you, since you came from such, a, from such a hard scientific background, how you found that balance between hard science and the kind of art of winemaking in, in your career. What I learned most in biochemistry, besides being able to use my mind in ways I hadn't anticipated, <laughs> it was hard for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I did take four years of math in high school, all the way through calculus. It's not like, you know, I can't do math, but um, some of these um, things were challenging, mm -hmm. like the year of physical chemistry and the quantum class was really hard at first because um, it, problem solving, like solving electron potential wells and Schrodinger's equation for the hydrogen atom, you know, that shit is, takes a lot of math and it took me a while. I spent a lot of time in the lab getting personal help, but once I did, it stuck with me the most and mm -hmm. I learned to appreciate a lot of things, but I was very fortunate that my uh, teachers at OSU also wrote the book on biochemistry that most biochemists uh, biochemistry programs throughout the country were using uh, Matthews and Van Hold, mm -hmm. and they were quite genius. And uh, I learned pretty quickly how miraculous life is. Uh, it's really impossible and beautiful and elegant how we uh, channel substrates in cells. How uh, subcellular organelles actually associate channels. I mean, there's an efficiency that you can't even imagine. Like, I don't know, maybe you have a biochemistry degree. But even inside a cell, it's impossible. Like, uh, cascade reactions and how energy is just enough is released so it doesn't overwhelm and kill, but not such a low amount that it doesn't do anything. I mean, it's, it's how does that even happen? I remember in biochem, we had lots of interesting discussions about life and, and to me, yeah, there's always going to be those people that just focus and memorize and they have very uh, narrow uh, specialist minds, mm -hmm. but science never was intended to be like that. Like during the Age of Enlightenment, uh, most of the great scientists, including Darwin, also read poetry and Darwin himself was very spiritual. In fact, he was Christian. Incidentally, um, in case you didn't know, and it's an aside, but one half of Darwin's theory of evolution has been missing historically. It, uh, it's not just uh, adaptive selection, but there's sexual selection, mm -hmm. and that's coming out right now. And it's been hidden for a hundred years because it has huge implications with regard to the equality of men and women. Well, anyway, that you might want to read that. A yeah. Yale ornithologist uh, published it about a year ago uh, called Beauty Matters. Anyway, uh, so how did all that, well, I mean, it's, it's not just one thing. Uh, but through David Lyatt and Irie, mm -hmm. uh, he always taught me to trust the vines. Mm -hmm. And you always hear people, oh, the, the vineyard makes the wine, you know. And, well, that's actually not, it's true and it's absolutely not true. <laughs> Look, if, if the wines, if the vineyards came in and I didn't, didn't do shit, 
uh, we'd have a disaster mm -hmm. in here and you wouldn't be able to drink my wines. It's not that I'm manipulating them or spoofing them or working them and designing them, but it's a partnership. Mm -hmm. I'm their advocate. It's like when you're raising children. You know, I, you know my daughters aren't mini-me's. I, I don't try to make them live my unfulfilled lives. <laughs> my job is to help them to master themselves, mm -hmm. to be aware of themselves, and and to follow their own natures and their own paths, and be there and if they need to talk to me about stuff, because life's really hard when you're really honest. Mm -hmm. And it's even harder when you're aware. So it's kind of like that with wine for me. But between David Lett and drinking Burgundies and just my own trajectory the past 20 years, uh, I'm really interested in what I just said. Like, I, I like it, you know, so my wines sometimes, a lot of people aren't gonna like my wines, but usually the ones who do like them, they, they are touched, mm -hmm. they're moved. It's not like, oh, this is, this is definitely a 98 mm -hmm. type of wine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like that, I don't care about that. I would have done things very differently if I'd cared about that. And there's nothing wrong with that thinking. It's just not what I do. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I, I want people who drink the wine to feel a tiny bit of relief from the human condition. And it's not gonna come from me. <laughs> I don't have those powers. It, it would definitely be coming from a beautiful farm like Marsh Vineyard or something like that. Mm -hmm. Wine has that ability because it, it is historically the the symbol of the archetype of indestructible life. Quoting Carl Karenyi Dionysos, he's a philosopher and an archaeologist. Um, that's what the subtitle of his book about Dionysos. But when you think about it, uh, wine is also part of alchemy too, but this idea of something dying and then releasing new life, that is exactly what wine is. That's why it's in communion. Yeah. It's some powerful shit. And that's, you know, I, I, I don't want to mess around. I want to be in that world. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just like firing fermenters up and mm -hmm. <laughs> getting her done and <laughs> getting her out there. Like, right. that's, not, that's not my role. That's why my winery always will be small and I'll always be a little bit broke and very vulnerable and fragile. Mm -hmm. But they are all over the world now. Mm -hmm. um, so. Tell, tell me about that process a little bit, about sort of starting your own thing without really the resources to go all in and buy a huge estate vineyard. I still can't. So tell me how that, tell me how that's worked, and you talked, about, you talked about your kind of slow growth, so tell me how you get your name out there and how you get people to, uh, in, to find your wines. I don't know. <laughs> they came to me. <laughs> I'm too busy working. I work 80 hours a week. I have no life. My daughter's just started not hating me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Um, I suspect I, I, I never had a marketing or a PR person. Mm -hmm. It's just from, you know, when I meet people over the years, I've been in this industry for 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, I make friends and people like the wines and it, it's by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, I care about people. Mm -hmm. I mean, my brother says I hate everyone, but, and that's kind of true too, but I love people also. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, it's at this. I don't. I can't even give you an answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how. It, it, it's definitely not me. I don't have the 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 nature to say, "Hey, you know, you want some of my stuff? It's really good." <laughs> like, I am not like that. I'm just like, you don't want to buy this wine, do you? Like, that's how I am. <laughs> like, you don't want this. Like, so it's not, you know. A few people here and there in the past probably tried it and have been my angels. You know, Chamber Street Wines has certainly been an angel to me. Yeah. Um, some wine writers have been angels to me. Uh, that even though they, I can't speak for them, but they probably know that the general public here probably doesn't like them as much as they do personally. But that's okay. Um, but so once you get going, then you know, like my my wines are doing quite well in London so I go to the real wine fair every year and then all these importers from other countries in Europe go there and they've helped me out a lot mm -hmm. um, uh, and then once you're out there and people try your wines and some other country wants it and 
Like they're at the Mugaritz in Spain. I don't even know how they got there because I don't have, I think it's through my London importer. Mm -hmm. um, they're in Paris, they're in Luxembourg. There's a master wine in Switzerland who buys it. But he doesn't buy very much, but I don't even know what city he's in exactly yet. But um, I don't know. That's incredible. Yeah. I'm more well known probably over there than than here in my home state. <laughs> Uh, tell me what that that's that has to be kind of an interesting feeling to have your wines your creations out there in 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 the world like that tell me what that what it means for you to, to sort of meet someone who's been touched by your wine to have that kind of connection through your wine well a lot of, i would say a good number of those are other producers <laughs> <laughs> i have a producer who's distributing my wine in vienna right now <laughs> it's called mein Klong. Mm -hmm. they make beautiful wines uh, we have a we have a tribe. We have a community, mm -hmm. and and by the way, I really love my producer friends across the world. We we inspire each other, mm -hmm. and I send people their way. I, I love these people. I don't know. It's I just feel better about the world somehow. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that translates into oh, this is good for me financially or. It makes me feel like I'm hot shit, just because my wine's somewhere far away, more than somewhere close. Mm -hmm. That's silly. We always go on vacations thinking, oh yeah, I went to the Maldives, but people who live near there don't think it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not that big, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just that's where I'm selling it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, maybe it's my uh, having grown up in the Netherlands to just keep my, keep some feet in the ground over there somehow makes me feel good. I don't know. So tell me about the, the Oregon wine industry as you've seen it since you're, say, 20 years in now or so. Tell me what you've seen change in the industry uh, besides just obviously the pure size. What else about the industry has, has changed since 2000? Well, a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's great that Oregon is being recognized globally for beautiful wines. Um, I've, you know, even even in 2000, I was such a newcomer. I had to pay my dues big time mm -hmm. to the people who were already there. Like back then, that's how you did it. Like no one is going to buy your plunk unless you were vetted first through. A, a, a chain of working for others mm -hmm. and proving yourself that way mm -hmm. and that because there wasn't that much and usually people who bought wine back then contrary to what you think knew more about wine than the general populace does today because very few people drank it back then and the ones who did you know they're buying end stacks of Grand Cru birds because that's you could back then mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. so it was kind of this counterintuitive thing where People who came later think, oh, well, you know, they were kind of podunk, but now we came in and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, told them how to make wine better and brought in Dijon clones and were farming better. And I don't know. I've tried some wines from the 80s recently, and they're drinking pretty well. <laughs> podunk or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm not so sold on that, that narrative right now, mm -hmm. but... I can't even tell you how much I think it's changed because I can't, I don't have time to track it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been exponential. Mm -hmm. We have the internet now, we have social media now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot more people drinking wine now mm -hmm. who have no precedence, no uh, experience with wine. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, a lot of people are, their drivers for drinking wine aren't necessarily related to quality or there are more social reasons, mm -hmm. which is great. I love that people are very welcoming and providing community for people visiting and making them feel welcome mm -hmm. uh, here in Oregon. Uh, I worry that, I worry a little bit that in the sea of young vine, Pinot Noir, very high price points for young vines that there's going to be some pushback in the markets, which I've been hearing already from Psalms, um, Psalms, and 
wine buyers, it's like, you, you know, there's, we, we get so much Oregon wine and, you know, they're all starting to taste, it's kind of similar and they're very, they're lovely, but, you know, I can only carry two or three on my list because they're kind of the same, you know. And that is not the way we started off. Like, there are, if they're a different vineyard, you know, they're going to be different wines. And so my hope is that people appreciate their vineyards and really trust them and uh, hold back on, you know, charging $100 for Young Vine blends uh, because there, there's going to be some pushback because there's a lot of wine out there. I know this from my travels. Mm. I mean, a lot of wine just hasn't made it over here yet. Uh, and it, but it is because these, the, the younger people are, they get bored and they don't want to drink their parents' wines and they don't want any part of that. Mm -hmm. and guess what? They're the ones buying the wines now. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for something, you know, real. They don't want to be told brochure type language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just hope that people own that. And I, we have so many good people in this industry. I, I love this industry, mm -hmm. fiercely. Um, I, there's people, I can't tell you how many people, like, I suspect that IPNC, they made us, they started assigning us tables because we all love each other so much that we would all just congregate. <laughs> and uh, the, the guests were just going, um, we haven't talked or to or seen a single winemaker this whole time. And <laughs> it's true, like, a lot of us really love each other hard. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm an old person and I've been around a while and David did give me my own autographed portable curmudgeon and I feel like he's dead and so I need to uh, carry that torch and you know being a curmudgeon doesn't come from a place of being bitter it comes from a place of idealism and love and you know sometimes you got to tell truths that are not fun because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> you care mm -hmm. and uh, you're not going to see me on any OPC panels or IPNC panels ever because of this. Like, <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> Too much truth being told. Well, I, I don't know. I just, I just, I'm, I'm not going to not say these things. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, as you look ahead for Oregon wine, what do you see? What, what are you excited about? What are you maybe concerned about? In addition to what you kind of already talked about. I see a lot of people doing what I dreamed of earlier. Mm -hmm. they're, they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Even young ones. What I fear, and that's good, to me I'm very hopeful. What I fear is being assimilated, like the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> we are being commodified as we speak. Our ethos and our, the Oregonian way is actually being commodified by outside entities, mm -hmm. including having their own locutuses represent them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Star Trek, if you want to, I will talk about Star Trek for two more hours if you want to talk about Star Trek. <laughs> we could, uh, yeah, yeah we, could, we could do that. I mean, I, I could go on with that, but that's a pretty great metaphor. And we, that's something that's not a really good plan, but I, how do we stop? We, we can't. Everyone has a right to sell to whomever they want, and people have a right to do whatever the fuck they want. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, we are in late stage capitalism, and that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But I'm, you asked me what I fear, and that is what I fear. Mm -hmm. I don't want to become a sea of mediocrity and fancy brass and glass and, you know, bland, expensive crap. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen that happening other places and that, that has a very limited uh, uh, lifetime or half-life, that approach, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And people have to think about the younger people. You know, baby boomers aren't gonna live forever. They do not want any part of this stuff, right? Am I speaking correctly? <laughs> I have daughters who are 24 and 22, and they can't even handle it, like the talk of it. <laughs> the, the way we talk about it, and just, you know, millennials are coming on. And we need to think about that. You know, having all these big, fancy, and it's great, it's very impressive, but it's gonna be hard to get one of those in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
You've got to think about everyone. What about for yourself as you look ahead to the future? What do you think for yourself and, and for your for your label? Uh, my goal is to pay off my debt and live to do it. <laughs> as soon as I stop making wine, I'm done. Mm -hmm. Like, I, if I can't do it myself, uh, there's no point. I'm not trying to build up a brand and sell it off or cash out. If someone offers to do that, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. I just do my best every day, every moment. I, you know, it, it kind of bothers some people who ask me that. Like, what's your, you know, goal? It's like, it's all the way all the time, man. Like, if, if I, that, that, that is my goal. Like, uh, excellence at all times. And if that, if, if you know, if I can't make it doing that, then having a plan's not going to help either. I hope I overshoot that. I hope I pay down my loans sooner. Hello. Hi. Hey, here you got it back here. <laughs> Quiet party. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, what are you are you thinking of uh, as you expand? Are you thinking of trying anything different? Are you just kind of any different kind of variety, any different mm -hmm. kind of anything like that, or is it just trying to kind of perfect what you're doing? I always have more work to do. Each year I learn something new. I could always respond better to those uh, vineyards, Pinot Noir, but you know, I, I make Chardonnay now, and I mean, I even did a skin contact Chardonnay, that's pretty crazy. I do pink Pinot Gris, you know, I do Pinot Blanc, I do Pinot Blanc and an Acacia bunch, and uh, I'm not seeking to expand much beyond the volume I'm doing now mm -hmm. because this is about as much as I can do with the quality that I do. Mm -hmm. It's like when you go to a restaurant and the chef cooks, like I want my wine to always be that the chef did it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And those little, little things, like things you catch when you're topping or stuff like that, that needs to be me. Even cleaning, I like it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, I'm always interested, like, if, look, if Chad Stock said, hey, we planted some Ufark finally over at Johan. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll make you fart. It's a Hungarian white that I love. Little stuff like that. But I really like dealing only with old vine Pinot Noir, self-rooted if possible. So uh, at, with my, uh, <laughs> I don't have the power to get more of that than I get. And I'm very lucky to work with what I do now. Mm -hmm. So I feel very thankful, mm -hmm. very grateful. Yeah. I think I know the answer to this, but I'm curious, what, why old vine and why self-rooted? Self what, what is it about that combination? It, science is not going to support this, because very little in, it's very, okay, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, old vines, the roots are down more deeply, they're, they have more equi <coughs> equilibrium, mm -hmm. so vintage to vintage, they're able to deal with it. Um, uh, they have stronger character, so they're, they're vines that I'm responding to instead of raising up. Mm -hmm. uh, we already, the way we train our vines here is already very codependent. If you've traveled the world, Burgundy used to be Goblet, and they were free. Mm -hmm. But if, I know, you, it's not commercially viable to farm that way. <laughs> but even uh, Virgil sh shoe positioning double guillot, I mean, that's very small parts of the world has has trellising like that. Mm -hmm. So already we, we set the vines up where we're having to constantly go in there and train them and deal, you know, help them because they're so like weak. Mm -hmm. um, so already we have that going. So I'd rather have old vines and that are going deep in the earth that have strong characters. I mean, you can look at them at Marsh and at Weber Vineyard and see that they each have their own like, they're crazy, they look like old olive trees, some of them. Mm -hmm. um, I can't prove it, but the vines make wines, in my opinion, that have a lot more character and noblesse. Much more interesting. Um, young vines can make delicious wines, but I'm not looking for just delicious. And uh, self-rooted because there is no impotence, there's no interference of going through an American rootstock into the scion. Remember, clear transmission, that's all I care about. That's why I don't use new oak either. None. And I don't inoculate with commercial yeast or anything like that. Just the yeast that were on the grapes are fermenting the wines. And quite frankly, all my white label 
Pinot Noirs, except for Highland, have no press wine in them whatsoever. It's all free run for the same reasons. Everything I do is for that. So you, you have so you can feel and enjoy and hear the vineyard. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> so, so the last question I have for you. Uh, so you took kind of an interesting interesting route into the industry, and I'm really curious your answer on this. Uh, what advice would you have for someone who wanted to join the Oregon wine industry today? My advice is archaic. It doesn't apply. I gave that advice to one person once, and they said, oh, <laughs> there's no money in that, and it'll take too long. <laughs> like, so they did it another way. Mm -hmm. My advice is not valid. Okay. <laughs> if you could give your ideal advice, what well, would, what it would it be? But it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you want to make glue glue and like, <laughs> there's, this is an industry that welcomes all kinds of wines. Mm -hmm. I hope, mm -hmm. I hope that that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to w make wines, it, you know, the way I do, then I can give advice. But if you're, you know, Few people want to make wines the way I do, <laughs> and that's fine. I mean, I very few would want to. That's not they're they're not interested in that. They don't care. It's not relevant to them. But in general, I'd say you know you should probably work for another winery more than just a few harvests. If you, but of course, you can hire a consultant. You see, it's not the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, I, if I start saying advice, I'm going to get into a whole can of worms that just is not important. Fair enough. But my advice would be depending on what their wishes are. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge range. So to ask me to give advice, you know, what do you want? What are you doing? Why are you doing wine? What do you see? Your, you know. Uh, what are your price points going to be? Where do you want to see your wines? Are you going to sell them just in Oregon? Are you going to sell them uh, through distributors? Uh, do you want to be on the best wine list in the country and across the world? Uh, do you want to make wines a place? Do you want to, or do you want to just make like crazy pet gnats that people are just going to love and drink? You know, in the summer. You know, I don't know because there's a huge range of what people want to do and what they dream about. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I would say, depending on what they're dreaming about, I would give advice accordingly, if they even ask for it. I, I don't suggest anyone do what I do. <laughs> <laughs> You've kind of taken the path less traveled here, I think. Well, it's not, I don't know, it's just, it's not easy. You have to be insane to do things the way I do it. <laughs> it's hard. You, you know, you shouldn't do this unless you really, really, that's what you really want to do. I don't recommend it. Well, that's actually excellent advice, so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to be a winemaker? <laughs> no. No, no. No, I've been saying enough. I like, I like the side of the camera a lot better, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, who said I wanted to be behind a camera? <laughs> or in front of one. Well, we appreciate you taking your time today. We do really appreciate this. Uh, Thanks. I don't have any questions left for you. Uh, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't? Anything we, we didn't cover that we should have covered? No, I don't think so. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate this. Okay. Thanks.